My name's Paul Bestall. This is Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. Well, we have had a phenomenal couple of weeks on the podcast with some incredible feedback from new listeners from around the world. I never imagined that the show could reach countries like Panama, Guam, Japan, Fiji or even Russia. Thank you so much for finding us. And if you're from abroad, drop us an email at mysteriesandmonsters at gmail.com to let us know where you're listening from. I was also lucky enough to appear on episode 200 of Into the Fray as part of a podcast collective sharing our scary encounters. Congratulations to Shannon for the first 200 episodes and here's to many more. I'd also like to say a big thanks to Ian and Brennan over on the Ghost Story guys for being wonderfully nice about us again. Thank you very much chaps, it's always appreciated. So, this week we're staying in Australia as we are delighted to be joined once again by Yowie Dan. So far, Dan's appearance on episode 6 is our second most popular show that we've done so far, and plenty of listeners have wanted his return. In the four months since we last spoke, Australia has been bitten by the Yowie bug. All of a sudden in Australia, Yowie's are big news. Sightings, close encounters and other weird happenings have all been reported in the last couple of months. Don't forget to rate and review us on your podcatcher to help the show grow. You can also subscribe to our channel on YouTube, join us on the Mystery and Monsters Facebook groups, and you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. So without further ado, let's join Yowie Dan. We're delighted to welcome Yowie Dan back to Mysteries and Monsters. Since we last spoke, it seems that Australia has caught the Yowie bug and the coverage has gone through the roof. Dan, welcome back to the show. How are you? Very good, Paul. How, how are you going? Hey, we're doing all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've been obviously keeping my eye on uh, all things Yowie, as, as you know, and being a big fan of it. And it, it, uh, it all seems to be kicking off down your side. Yeah, it seems to be a bit of an explosion with people that are interested in the Yowies right now. Um, I really think it's got to do with um, social media, like the platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and we've got the AYR. And there is, in Queensland, uh, a newspaper that's bringing out, um, like, Yowie, uh, people that have seen Yowies or had stuff happened to them mm. and they're writing about it which is um a good thing and but that's what happens it's it's, it's kind of like the the flavor of the month mm. um there's a lot of people coming out which is good because we need um fresh witness reports and, and um it's just given a like a whole new lease of life and you know it's a good thing for um people like myself you know yarrow researching and um you know uh, you know the new reports that come out, they give us, um, and, and the latest reports, they give us fresh news of what these creatures are doing. Um, then the old reports, because the old reports from like the 60s, 70s and 80s and 90s, they tell us what they were doing back then. But the new reports, you know, things might have changed since then. So, you know, um, you know it's, it, it's, it makes a different aspect on what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I saw obviously the big story that came out the last, couple of weeks was obviously this lady who lives in Tarzali so apologies for my pronunciation Dan um, <laughs> who's who's basically come forward with with a variety of interactions and uh, 
behaviors and and she's claiming that they're fetching a presence and and basically she's got this family living on her property i mean what do you think to all this because it, it it is quite a stunning story that she's come out with yeah well there is a lot of people that um i recently did a talk a few months ago up at um nana Glen, which is in coffs harbour which you you got to drive about six hours six and a half hours north of sydney mm. so it's in you know central you know up the central part of uh, New South Wales. And there's a lot of people around there that do research and they don't bring anything out into the open. They keep it to themselves. Yeah. And a lot of people talk about, like, uh, these creatures have got infrasound where they make a noise which it can kind of, you know, make you feel weird and startle you and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, anyone that brings out any information, it's all good for us to kind of learn from. And while we're researching, if it happens to us, we know what's going on. So, yeah, so, you know, what, what people have got to realise that, you know, people, some people might bullshit, obviously, what's yep. going on. But when you get these stories that are really intricate, like this person saying, mm. you know, you've got to, you know, really, you know, do a little bit more research into what they're talking about. And if it happens to you, you kind of sit there and go, hey, this could be you know, real. So I'm, I'm really more on the line of that this person is telling the truth and these things are actually real and these things are happening because it's coming when these people, they, they, they live right on, like their border of their land is right next to like the bush. Like, yeah. And this is a thick bush. And some of this is like old bush where it hasn't been, um, they haven't taken it down for logging or anything. Mm. This the stuff. This is bush that's been there for a, a long time, like longer than anyone has been alive. So um, there's anything could be living in there. So you know, these are the reports that you know you take in and you look at, and then you study them, and then you use it to help you in your own research. So now these are reports that are really really good, and then we're glad that these people are coming out in the open. Yeah, I, I think. Because obviously it's it, it's a subject I've been interested in for years, Dan. Because obviously the first time I, I came across the Yowie um, was was probably about 20 years ago, and I just thought it just sounded really compelling. Obviously, as we mentioned the first time we chatted a couple of months ago, but yeah, I think for me, looking at what's been going on over the last sort of six, seven months, I think the guy that had the sighting, the Withering sighting, you know, the guy that was driving along the road and it basically smashed his truck. Yeah, I think from that. That story hit in the press, it seems that it's just been taken a lot more seriously down there these days by your mainstream media, because I've seen a lot of reports in your version of the Daily Mail down there. They're clearly thinking, I mean, you could be quite cynical about it and say, well, they're just doing it for, you know, the revenue clicks online. But I've noticed more and more of your papers <coughs> down there seem to be covering the Yowie in a more sensible manner than perhaps they were doing five, ten years ago. So... Do you, do you think it's um, a progression that we've seen uh, similar to what's happening in the States with the UFO conversation, that it's been taken a bit more seriously, that there's too many reports now that people are beginning to think that there's clearly a lot more to this than we originally thought? What I feel it is, it, there's the social media, and you've got people like myself and that, that have been out there and other platforms it's making people more comfortable with coming out with their stories. And there's a lot of old stories coming out from the you know, 1950s and 60s and all that. Yeah. So there's a lot more people feeling comfortable to bring it out. Because back in the day, if you said, hey, i seen something like a hairy man, people would say, yeah, Yo, you're crazy. Mm. But now, you know, with all the platforms coming out and the people talking about it, and a lot of people get into these groups and they'll read all the reports and they'll say, hey, that's what happened to me. And then after maybe reading them for a month or two, they'll be compelled to come out and tell their own story. But really, who's going to say a Yowie ran in front of you, punched the front of your truck, and I work for Mack Trucks, and everyone knows how big a truck is, yeah. punched it and left dents in the truck and ran away, and then he didn't even want to tell his wife about yeah. it. Because she, he thought she, she'd think he's a dickhead. Which <laughs> what, you know? If you're if, if been, been in Australia, if, if 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 you're a husband, you do something stupid. That's why your wife says you're a dickhead. So yeah, um, yeah. So basically, he's kind of just come out and said, "This is what it is." And but all these people that are coming out with new reports tell the same thing that 
the old reports have said. And a lot of the people have got nothing to do with reading Yowies or reports or being in, in groups, and they all say the same thing, how it looked. No neck, you know, full of hair, broad shoulders, eight, seven foot tall, could run up a hill in two seconds and stuff like that. So you've got to, you know, you can't believe every report, but yeah. a vast majority of them, yeah, you can take on what they've said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I found it quite intriguing because I've obviously, like I say, I can see the development coming along here. And as, as we said in our original conversation, I've always been really struck when I've listened to, to a lot of Yowie witnesses because the general feeling I have is that Australians aren't one for for mucking about really it's not the kind of no no bullshit mate no bullshit straight to the point yeah absolutely and you know it's a it's a tough place to live you know as we've discussed before you know some of these people are out in the middle of nowhere you know it's a tough environment especially what's going on these days i mean that's i mean do you think that's having some kind of effect on why people are uh, are, a seat well it seems that there's there's like a momentum of sightings building do you think that's a lot to do with what's going on environmentally in Australia at the minute? That they're, they're feeling a bit under pressure? No, not really. There's, there's, like you said, there's a lot of people that live in remote, remote places. Mm. And, you know, they might... Before, like, the internet's only been around since the, like, mid to late 90s. And yeah. then it's only gathered strength in the 2000s now. And a lot of people didn't have the ability to have the internet until we had Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff. So the people in the remote places have had a chance to like sit down and go and sit down and see what other people have been saying and say, hey, that's what I saw, but I thought I was only hearing things or maybe thought I saw something, but hey, no, that's what I saw. And then they'll write their report. And, you know, you got to remember that you walk in the Australian bush it's very thick. Once you get in one or two or three metres, in some places it's very thick. You just cannot penetrate it. It gets, it's, you know, there's some plants that scratch you up mm. or there's dangerous animals and stuff like that. But, you know, people, like I said, they're getting back to um, social media and it's getting spread out more and more and they can relate their stories to the people that are living more in the cities mm. or on the fringe of the bush are saying this is what we saw, and they're saying yes, this is what I saw, and it's you know it's all getting collected in like one big bowl, and everyone's telling the same story. So like I I know I've seen two different types of yowies. I've saw the small one, the Janjadi, yeah. but that's the first when I saw that that's that was like um, I can say eight years after I first started researching, and that's when I knew 100% that was something there. Yeah. And then I later on saw a bigger one. But there's plenty of people over... You've got to remember, Australia can cover the whole of America. But there's only certain parts of Australia where everyone lives because there's a lot of desert, a lot of Arab regions where people can't live. Yeah. It's just too dry or too, you know, too cold, too dry, or, 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 or you know, just the conditions are too harsh for people to live. Mm. So... And then on the top of Queensland, going all the way down Queensland, which is a big state, all the way down New South Wales to Victoria, it's called the Great Dividing Range. And that's where most of the encounters and most of of the sightings are. It's all a hilly region. And a lot of the places in the Blue Mountains, which is about 50, 60 k's west of of Sydney, there's a lot of places where people have not even gone. It's just too hard. You can't get there. So the the the, um, the road, which is called the Great Western Highway, which goes over the Blue Mountains, mm. it was, you got the explorers, which was Blacksland, Wentworth and Lawson. It took them about 26, 29 days to get over from one side of where, from the, the east side to the west side. Yeah. And, 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 and about 90% of that way they took to get over there is still the same way that we go today. Mm. So... And that took them a long time to get over there. But there's a lot of places that where no one's ever been. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's why the Yowie is a bit of a, people think it's a myth, but it's really, to me, it's a truth. Yeah. 
I mean, the other thing as well, Danny, is like you said about the size of Australia, it's an, it's, a, it's an enormous country, and people, for, I think a lot of people just don't realise it. Because, they, you know, for, if you ask your average British person, they probably think Perth about 100 miles away from Sydney. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because I don't think people understand just how large Australia is as a country. Um, but when you compare it, like you say, the size-wise, it would cover the states. It's got, what, what's the population of Australia? 40 million? No, it's about 24, yeah. if that. So, you yeah, know what and, I mean? You'd say it, you've got a country the size of America with a tenth of the population. Oh, easily. Like, most of the people live in Sydney. You've got, like, eight, eight and a half million or something in yeah. the Sydney region. So that's within the Blue Mountains, which is about 50 k's west of it, yeah. in and maybe, you know, 20 or 30 k's above and below. And that's, you know, in the Sydney region. So... Um, uh, a lot of people live in Melbourne and Brisbane, but you've got Adelaide, Perth and Darwin, which is, you know, and Tasmania, which is an island down below Victoria. Yeah. you got your, you know, your, your population there, but most of the people are in Sydney. That's the biggest population. But, um, yeah, uh, it covers, you know, uh, uh, America quite easily, and they've got... 300 or something million, I yeah. don't know how many, but we're, we're battling to get, we've got about 24 million, I think maybe 23 and a half. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So, we're, you know, the, the reports keep coming out in this fresh reports. I've, I've got a few people that have, um, you know, gave me fresh reports for the Yowie Times, my magazine, mm. uh, and, and I'm going to gonna get them coming up, you know, when the next uh, article comes out. But, yeah, people don't realise that if you go from Sydney and you go to Perth, it's going to take you like three days, constant driving to get there. Yeah. You know, so and you go along the Nullarbor Plain, which is the longest straight road in the world. Yeah. So I don't know how long it is, but it takes a bloody long time to get there because <laughs> my brother did it once and he said it took him a long time. And you've got to realise that you drive along that road, you've got road trains that come past you. Yeah. And road trains is a truck with about six or seven or eight trailers behind them, yeah. and they will pass you like you're standing still. They'll be doing like 150, 180 k's an hour, and they'll go bang, straight past you. And by the time you even know how big it is, it's already gone past you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's just a very straight... It's just a very different environment, I think. And, and, and for me, that's one of the things I've always found compelling about Yowies is, is, is purely the size of the country compared to the population and I think that's the key thing we've got here Dan yeah but one thing I really want to talk about is how long has a Yowie been in Australia yeah people talk about people get there and talk about all right what a Yowie looks like and all this kind of stuff but all right so basically they said the Aboriginals which come through, like, from Southeast Asia. They said they come from, like, India, like Sri Lanka. Yeah. They've come down through Southeast Asia. They've, you know, they've evolved and changed and eventually come down to Australia, mm. which is up from 60,000 years. And they've even found some stuff that's been, like, that Aboriginals have made and stuff that's up to 100,000 years, I reckon. So, so if you look at it from the 60,000 years that they've been here, there was the last ice age that affected Australia was between 25,000 and 16,000 years ago. Yeah. So I'm looking at the, the, the Aboriginals have been here since 60,000 years, and they said the Yowies were here before they were here. The stories that come down from the Aboriginals, they said they were already here when they their ancestors first turned up. So how long has the Yowie been in Australia? Mm. So I'm pretty much... I can't, no one can say for sure, did they evolve in Australia? You know, like the marsupials? Yep. And, you know, because the marsupials kind of come down from the megafauna. you got, you know, the, 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 the massive, you know, kangaroos that were nine foot tall <laughs> and, and wombats that were like as big, big as a mini. That's yep. how big they were. They were massive creatures. You can watch it all on YouTube. There's a, there's a yep. really good um, documentary about it. So, the, 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 the Aboriginal said the Yowies are already, their story said that Yowies are here before they got here. So if they got here from 60,000 years, were the Yowies here 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 years ago? No one really knows. That's what I kind of wrote in a, a Yowie Times article. Mm. So 
what I was getting to was the last ice age was between 25 and 16,000 years ago that affected Australia, down near Australia. Mm. So you got you had a British naturalist called Alfred Russell Wallace, and he drew up a line between um, it was between like uh, what could I say? It was Borneo, Sulawesi, and it went through the Lombok Strait between Bali and Lombok. So that was virtually what he did. He was a naturalist, and he worked for the East India Company. Yep. And he went all around all the islands, all around Southeast Asia and everything like that. And he was finding that one set of, you know, the, the fauna and flora weren't like another region. So he kind of worked out within a certain period of time that nothing crossed from these islands to these islands. So it was like... it was, the this boundary line separated the eco zone between Asia and Malaysia, which is a transitional zone between a- Asia and Australia. Yeah. And so he kind of worked out in 1859, he wrote up that to say there's nothing crossed these lines at a certain period of time, but he couldn't say how long ago what it was. Mm. But then we get back to the Aboriginals that they said they've been here from 60,000 years, and there's some things recently that have been posted that there could be up to 100,000. So the story say that the Yowies were here before they came here. So what I'm looking at was I read an article that you've got the Java man and yep. you've got um, the, uh, the other one from Flores. Yeah, Homo and then you've got, uh, Yes, and then you've got another one from the Philippines. Yeah. So what I was getting at was the yeah, is the Yowie related to one or two or maybe all of these eight kind of, you know, hominoid creatures, but because it's got down to Australia, and it could have been through an ice age that was much older yeah. that made it possible to come all the way down and travel from the Southeast Asia, say from like Philippines, all the way down to Australia, yeah. because every ice age is different, mm. and every ice age lasts longer or it's colder. That's, yeah. that, I've, that, that, that I've read about and, and, and researched. So it could have come down a couple of hundred thousand years ago, yeah. but it could have been related to these creatures and managed to get down here. And because Australia is so vast and it's like the biggest continent down in this region, it grew bigger to get from one region to another to search for food. Yeah. But these other creatures, you know, Java and Flores and in the Philippines, they stayed small because they didn't have to travel that far. Yeah. So that's what it's, – it's, it's a really, you know, compelling story that how long has this creature actually been here? Because I don't think it, it, it evolved here. There's no no monkeys in Australia, but I think it's come down from the Southeast Asia and it's evolved, you know, it could be a couple of hundred thousand years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> that's the key thing as well. I mean, I was, I was talking to a chap called Ron Moorhead um, the other week, Dan, who, who's um, – a very well-known Bigfoot researcher in the States. And um, he was of a very similar theory in regards to the fact that, you know, 20 years ago there were humans and Neanderthals and that was it. And now, since that period, we've found four other species of of human or part of the human lineage. Um, So, you know, it it just continues to develop and and our knowledge of, of what happened before you know we we evolved into what we call ourselves homo sapiens and humans you know it, yeah. the, the whole story is, is continually developing and it, it it just shows that you know how how quickly this is this is changing because you know like i say you've got uh, you know the java man you've referred to and uh, the new one that was just discovered in the philippines and then we've, we've we've got the denisovians up in europe that nobody was completely aware of they found new evidence of those in the last few weeks in an area they'd never found them before i think that was in tibet so yep. you know it's continuing to develop and and uh, you know, with the greatest respect dan you, you know I'm, as i'm sure you're aware there's probably areas of australia that no 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 one has really investigated or done any archaeological work there there could be all sorts hiding away in the middle of the country yeah because there's there's people got, <clears throat> a lot of people look what if had recently is a lot of people think Australia's all grassy plains and there's nothing there. <laughs> uh, um, 
it's like anywhere else. There's mountains and deserts and whatever. But, you know, you, you've, you've got to do a bit of research. Like the archaeologists that find dinosaur remains, yep. they've done a lot of research. There's a lot, there's, a, a, there's like a footprint, footprint track um, up in Queensland, I think Northern Territory somewhere. I was reading about the other day. Um, I didn't get too much into it, but they're trying to you know, conserve it and make it a, into a, a museum. But they you know, researched the area and dug up and found them. So that's what we've got to do with the Yowies as well. But, you know, we've got to look into, like, um, doing the same kind of thing as them. Like, we've got to look into areas and think, like, well, they were looking at big dinosaurs that weighed tons. Mm. We're, we're looking at something that weighs a couple of hundred kilos. So um, there is instances here where there's, you find footprints in rocks, and it's, you can see, it, tell it's like an old Aboriginal footprint or a man footprint. You, you got that. But, um, yeah, it's very hard to um, to find any, any evidence of this creature. Um, you just got to... We're, we're, we're researching hard as we can in, 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 in places where we think that this creature could be. And that's what... Uh, the research equipment like sound recorders mm. and trail cams, even if you don't find a trail cam, like you don't find anything on the trail cam that's got something to do with yowies, as yeah. long as you can see there's animals around that could be a food source. And the sound recordings, I've had a lot of sound recordings where for some reason they don't really pick up the recorder. They just walk near it, but the, the trail cam, they, I think they can see the IR like mm. anywhere else. So the sound recorder is a really key piece of research equipment that will, you know, you can tell with something hopping, hopping past, but you can, but I've got sound recordings where you can tell this thing's actually walking past him bipedally. And that's what a lot of people say when they have their encounters. They said it was not hopping like a kangaroo because people that live near the bush, they hear the kangaroos and the wallabies hop all the time. But when you hear something walking like on two legs bipedally, that's what really spooks them out because they say, I can't see this thing. What's a person doing in this bush? But I can't see it. And that's what spooks them out. What is it? Mm. So it's, you know, but, but Australia is very vast and it's very hard to get every spot. And I don't think we'll ever will. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I know you met, you touched on it um, a few moments ago, Dan, in regards to the, the theory of infrasound um, being emitted, causing people to feel frightened or, or whatever. Um, and obviously, that's something that certain Bigfoot researchers um, ascribe to, to certain Bigfoot sightings, that there's a very similar parallel. So do you think that's because people have looked at Bigfoot research and tried to apply it to the Yowie, or do you think that they're just trying to come up with this explanation to why some people get this sense of dread despite not actually physically seeing something well actually i've had i've had something happen to me once like mm. that um if anyone in australia knows where wentworth falls is it's not far before katoomba which is the three sisters which is the major um area for people to go to see um, a lookout and stuff. Yeah. But I went to the right of the uh, Wentworth Falls and, and it's called Valley of the Waters and you go down there and it's just virtually a waterfall that keeps going down the landscape. And and so I went down there and I, and I had something, you know, that I, I kind of felt really weird. And I've been hiking previously that for about 10 years and I just didn't feel like normal. And I'm just going, I don't feel sick. Um, anything like that, and I'm just, and then all of a sudden, I just, I smelt that kind of like um, sulfuric kind of dead kind of smell, and I went, hey, something's following me here, and I've been down that track probably ten times before that, mm. set up some gear, yeah, and and this time it just felt different, and I felt really weird, and I felt kind of started feeling sick in the stomach, and that. The only time I can say that I knew I was getting followed by something that I could not see, and I tried to lay down on the track, and I got my camera out, and I had it filming, 
and I actually left the camera on the track and I kept walking away to see if something come over the over the the hill because mm. it was a bit of a hill there from where the trail went and I kind of like walked about 100 meters away and stayed there for about 10 minutes because I, I felt crook. I walked back up, got my camera, replayed it, didn't see nothing, and the smell went away. And people might say, oh, it could be a smell from a dead plant or this and that. Mm. But no, I've been in the Blue Mountains that many times. The smell's not like that. And I kind of went, I think this is the first time that I've felt a kind of intrasound, yeah. that something kind of like hit me before. That happened to me before I smelt the smell. And I started feeling a bit offish, like maybe I've had like three or four beers kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, gee, that, this, this, I, I feel like a cheap drunk here. I've had two or three beers and I'm already pissed. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on here? And then I cut, started thinking about people saying intrasound. And I'm really not, I wasn't really buying that kind of thing. But after I had that in, that feeling and that kind of encounter, I kind of thought this could be a possibility. Like there's different animals that make different sounds mm. that stir creatures to come to them. And I know there's fish that have got like you know, ones that live in a deep, have got like little lights to come up, yep. you know, and they kind of flip them around. So why is that not for a creature to make an interest sound to maybe startle a creature so they're easy to be a prey and they can get there and go bang and eat them. So, you know, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are there are plenty of animals in the you know in, uh, across all uh, species that have uh, you know a very unusual tactics. I mean, um, <clears throat> I know there are certain snakes that that can that can hypnotise their prey by the way they move and basically it just freezes what they're about to attack and and mm. you know you've you've got other animals. I know elephants communicate. You know, the vast differences by using an ultrasound frequency. Lions apparently give off a whales. certain... Whales as well. I mean, you, you think of how loud a whale song has to be to travel the depths of the ocean, Dan. I mean, it's... There are, per, yeah. you know, there are parallels across the animal kingdom. So I, I find it extremely unusual that we... You know, especially whales are mammals. So, and if we're talking about large hominids, they would have to be some part of the mammal kingdom. So it's it's not beyond the realms of comprehension that if there is something there, like you say, because it is something that seems to affect <coughs> Yowie witnesses and Bigfoot witnesses, that some people get this incredible sense of fear or, or, or just, a, just a really bad feeling about something. And, and, and like for you guys in, in Australia, you know that the only thing large enough to perhaps put you about a bit would be a, would be a, a large roo. But then again, if you've got a large roo bounding about, you're going to hear him. Yeah, we, we get large roos, but we do get the um, large pigs, yeah. which is um, out in the bush, and they're kind of like, you know, if you get a large pig around, I'd, everyone's more scared of them yeah. than the roos. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, they're, they're, like, they're like really big, mate. They're like, they weigh tons. Yeah. You know, that's how big they are. And I've seen them, so they're pretty big. So, But, the um, yeah, if you get a big male roo, that's um, – I'll tell you one really – um, story. Uh, there was a place up at Gosford, which is about uh, about an hour north of Sydney. Mm. This is back in 1989. I was in um, year 10 at, at school. Yep. So I was near, near the end of um, just leaving school. Mm. And it was called Old Sydney Town. And it was basically like when, the, you know, it was set up like when the English first come over and set up the town and they were dressed up in the old English, you know, army uniforms. And yeah. there was like you know, it was all different things about, you know, how Australia was when the English first colonised Australia. So me and me mates are walking around, you know, smart and saying, oh, yeah, we're good, we're in year 10, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we walk around this, like, building, and there's this kid from another school, he must have been about 10 years old, and there's this grey kangaroo, he's got him around the back of the neck, and it's kicking him in the chest. Ooh. And it just, it, 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 it couldn't get away. And it just kept kicking him. And the kangaroos, like, it wasn't a big kangaroo, but for a 10-year-old, he was purple and blue. He couldn't breathe. It just kept it kicking him in the chest. He just could not breathe. And then people think kangaroos aren't dangerous, but if a young kid gets grabbed by the back of the neck by this kangaroo with big claws, it's going to cut the back of his neck, 
my mate had to go up there and start fighting this kangaroo like it was in a boxing match because it wouldn't let go. Yeah. So he's punching it in the head, and then we're trying to get this kangaroo off. We finally got the kangaroo off, and we kind of gave this kid mouth to mouth mm. and brought this kid to life. And and get right. We got some of the boys to go and tell get an ambo. Yeah. And we got this kid to life. He was purple and blue from this little kangaroo. It was probably about five foot tall. Absolutely, this kid was dead if we didn't save him. So that's how bad, you know, this the the kangaroo what it is. It, you yeah. know, and that's the big males are like seven foot tall. If they grab you, like you're in trouble. Oh, so. Big you know, they're not they're not like skippy and they hang around and go, you know, hey Sonny, the, you know, <laughs> the, the old skippy from the 1960s and 70s, hey Sonny, that's where all the terrorists are over there. Go and tell Ranger Hammond to go and get them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, yeah, the females, <laughs> the female kangaroos are pretty placid, but the males, when it comes to mating season, yeah. they grab you, mate. You, you, you're always going to get scratched, and they could nick like uh, an artery or with this poor young kid, and like we we got kind of awards saving the kid. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, we just walked around like we, you know, smart Alex. Yeah, we know what we're doing. Next minute, we see this kid getting smashed by this kangaroo. Next minute, we might just start punching the crap out of this kangaroo. <laughs> and he said afterwards, his right hand was that swollen. He said it was like punching a brick wall. Yeah. He goes, I just couldn't. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 all animals in Australia are dangerous to a certain degree. And, um, but, you know, the Yowies, they are the same as the other animals. If you, like anything, you get them on the wrong day or it's the breeding season. You know, I've had uh, researchers say that they've been hunted out and been, like, coerced out to get out of this area and trees shaking and, you know, screams and everything happened. So, um, yeah, it's Australia's a very, um, it's very different to the other countries of the world. We're, we've got very different animals and um, you just got to respect them. Yeah, I mean that's the other thing as well. You know, we, we, when we're talking about some of the witness signs, you know, the, these are people travelling late at night or first thing in the morning, and they they occasionally see something run across a road or it's standing by the side of it. There is, I mean, that's the thing about Australia, though, Danny. It, it, it's not like in America where the the, the standard or, or Canada even the standard excuse for a Bigfoot sighting from a skeptic is, well, oh, well, you've seen a bear. Well, bear, yeah. You know, the, everybody's describing the same kind of thing in Australia. It's a tall, hairy, humanoid-type figure ranging from, you know, four foot to nine foot, I think, some of the some of the sightings. There is nothing, you know, even a roo. A roo doesn't look like a person at all. No. You know, what, even the shape of the head. Yeah, you might see if it was from, you know, looking at it from behind in the dark, fine. As soon as that turns its head, you know it straight away that that's not a human being. Yeah, I, I, I've walked in um, uh, Blue Mountains and other places and I've researched with other people up and down the coast. And the, even, the, even the kangaroos, and, and really not kangaroos, kangaroos are more in the plains. Yep. It's more the wallabies. And the wallabies are only small. They're only like three foot of that. Yep. You don't see kangaroos in hilly regions. They like to stay in the, in, in, the, around golf courses and stuff like that. Yep. So people that see these creatures, like there's nothing else out there that's going to be that tall and like, all right you see big kangaroos and they're pretty buff like you get a picture yeah. of a kangaroo that's big tall like they're pretty muscly things like they grab you you're not getting out of the way like you've got to really f fight for your life to get away from them if they want to hold you that you're not getting away mm. so but these people are telling about a big head no neck massive shoulders but massive shoulders are like three and four foot wide massive chest so you're looking at something that's like Andre the Giant and you kind of, kind of make it wider again mm. by another half a foot or something. And you just don't... Kangaroo, like people in Australia grow up, like any country, you grow up, you, you get taught, you know, what animals live in your country mm. and that's it. So, you know, people look up and go, oh, that's a roo. But, you know, when they see something different, that, hey, that's an ape thing, you know, like... And you can kind of tell, like, I've seen videos where you can see guys that are in ghillie suits or in some fake ape costume. You can see baggy around the legs and yeah. and they're, when they're walking. But, you know, when people are going in the middle of nowhere and they're driving in the car or something and then they look around and they see something that's massive, like eight foot tall, 
and it, the, the, the chest is that wide and it's full of hair and the eyes are just looking at them. It freaks them out because they're not, they're just sitting in the car going, oh, it's going to take me four hours to get from like Sydney to like Canberra or something. Mm. Next minute they see this massive ape creature in the side of the road that shouldn't be there or walks in front of them mm. and takes two strides to get over like 10 meter wide road. And they're like, what the hell was that? And then they kind of get on the internet and look up and see AYR, which is Australian Yowie Research, yep. and go, hey, this is what I've seen. And they look at all the other reports and it comes up and says, this is what we've seen. And they go, that's what I saw, exactly what you saw. So, and these reports are going all around Australia. And even the Aboriginals are saying, you know, reports. There's even Aboriginal reports on the um, AYR. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them are from the small Janjadis. Yeah. And they reckon they're they reckon they're the ones that are more mischievous, which they'll come in and they'll shake you if you're like laying in the bed at night and they'll run outside the door because a lot of people live in little the, the Aboriginals don't live in some just live in a small house and they'll leave everything unlocked so the Junjunnies will walk in and shake them and then or wipe the window up and then jump out the window and stuff like that. So <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, they reckon they they reckon the big ones and the small ones don't get on. Yeah, that's what the Aboriginals say. Yeah, they're, they're they're two different kind of creatures, and they don't get on. And the big ones don't like the small ones. So, um, hey. yeah, that's really weird. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, very strange. Because I know, obviously, you can look at stories in the, in in the states and Canada in, in you know Native American stories, and they've they, I mean, depending on where you are, they've they've obviously got a smaller one they call the Pugwudgie out there. Okay. Um, which is supposed, to, which, was, is, which is very similar in the kind of their description of it is is very similar to what you've said there about the Aboriginal. It's 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 classed as a mischievous trickster type creature. And is it's that a, it's a small is that area. America or is North, it America or is it in Canada? It's just around the border area, so the northeast uh, and the northwest. That's what I thought. Right. Yeah, so that's it's, what I thought. It's more about Canada way. So yeah. Yeah, but they, that's a very similar, especially the behaviours. They're classed as being very tricksterish and mischievous. Yep. yep. And they're always up to, well, not no good, but they're always just being a pain in the ass. <laughs> As that, the general. It's like they're, they're like about a, a clan of two-year-old kids. They just want yeah. to make make your life like hell. <laughs> <laughs> very true. So I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, that's the other thing that's always struck me in in comparison. With you know the Aborigines sto- Aboriginal stories and and the Native American and First Nation stories up in Canada, is that the similarities are remarkable for me, Dan. Absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Well, um, the the stories that the natives tell, which is Aboriginals and the American natives, yeah, they just tell what they've seen, and it mm. just goes along from father to son, or you know, mother to daughter, and they just keep it going, and it doesn't. It's it. Their stories are really intricate, and they remember them. It's not like um, Chinese whispers, where I can tell you something, and by the time it gets to ten people, it gets back to me. It's a different story. Yeah. They keep that. That they seem to have the ability to tell a story, and that story stays the same. Doesn't matter how many generations hear it, mm. because you know that, that you know with, with Europeans, the Chinese whispers kind of gets you know just. I'll tell you a story. You tell my wife. I'll tell your brother. You tell your sister. It just gets out of fashion. <laughs> it gets everywhere. It's like, you know, what's going on? So, but they seem to have that knowledge that, you know, it's in their makeup. That if your auntie, uncle, whatever brother tells you that story, you tell it to your son and they tell it to their son and their daughter and sister, whatever, it stays the same. Mm. And, 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 and and the stories from the American Indians – and the uh, in the Aboriginals and even some other areas in in uh, Southeast Asia, they all tell the same thing. Mm. How they're mischievous and they'll do this, but they won't want to hurt you, but they want to just like stir you up and be like little kids. And you know, like when you're trying to sleep in the morning, they'll come and jump on your bed to try and wake you up, and you're like, "What? Go away!" Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. That's what they are, because that's what the Aboriginals say. There's a few on the AYR audio reports where they're just trying to be asleep, and they'll come running in and jump through and ransack the place in about 10 seconds and run out. And then mm. all, they all wake up and go, what the hell are the Jones Juddies? But in Western Australia, they call them brown jacks. So, yeah. Um, 
there's a few different names for them all over Australia, even the Yowie. They, it really, the Aboriginals didn't say it was a Yowie. The Yowie was kind of made up, you know, from a European name, but they got different names for them, like Dulagal and, you know, and Quinkin. The Quinkins were like 12-foot creatures up in Northern Territory, yeah. stuff like that. So the, the, the Yowie is more like a European name. Uh, it was kind of like a Yahoo, and they kind of got blended in to be Yowie. Yeah. And um, so it was like the, the first... Do the um, Aborigine tribes, obviously uh, obviously there are different tribes for different areas of the country, Dan. Do they all have a different like, name for, for the same creature? Well, you, you, the, it's, you've probably got so many tribes in a certain area will have the same name. Yeah. But then it goes, like, there's... You, you look at... I'll give you, for instance, in, in, just in my area, there's uh, a suburb called Yonora. Yep. And that was after Yonora tribe. Mm. And you've got uh, Waringa, and that's up near the the coast, up near where Manly is. And that's another one. You've got Parramatta, which is the place of the eels. Kabramatta, yep. place of the snakes. They're named after tribes. And you've got Yaguna. You know, there's that many tribes. Like, if you don't believe... You can't realise that there's that many... In, you just got to realise that in the whole of Sydney, you've probably got like 50, 60 tribes yeah. within maybe 100 kilometres of each other. They're all different tribes. And they probably weren't big. They're probably maybe 20, 30 people in every tribe, yeah. maybe a little bit more. But there was like that many tribes around that the, after a certain area, the name might have changed. So you've had Dulagal... That's one I know. You've got, you know, John Jardy, and you've got the Brown Jack over in the Western Australia. But I know there's plenty more names I don't know of. I haven't really gone into the names mm. from the Aboriginals. But there's, there was that many tribes that in the Sydney region, it's not funny. you got plenty of tribes because a lot of the names for the Sydney suburbs are Aboriginal names. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so if you, it's like, I went, I've gone to a place called Maramara mm. National Park. That's an Aboriginal name. You know, Parramatta, Cabramatta, mm. you know, Yaguna, like Yonora, Warringa. There's they're all them kind of names like that. They're all Aboriginal names, and they're usually after the, it's the name of the area, but a tribe of a different name lived there. But they called that name like Parramatta, the land of the eels, because you know all the Parramatta River. There was heaps of eels. Yeah. See, so in Cabramatta, there was probably like heaps of brown snakes. So they called it Cabramatta, which means the land of the snakes. Yeah. But the tribe that lived there was a different name than Cabramatta. So yeah. it was, you know, I, I haven't got into the Aboriginal names, but um, yeah. But there's that many Aboriginal um, uh, tribes around Australia. There is thousands. There's a lot of them. Yeah, fascinating. So. The last time we we spoke, you were undertaking a, a new project. You were you were doing a documentary called Track. So how's that going, yes. Dan? Yes, that's a uh, it's a documentary that's been made by Attila Coldy, and he's made plenty of um, documentaries about UFOs, paranormal, and everything like that. And um, he got into it because he he was kind of filming for um, a UFO documentary. And had a Yowie encounter, but this was way back in like 2003. Mm. And where this happened, I had a similar thing happen to me. Where if you go to the Three Sisters, where a lot of people do, which is in Katoomba, mm. you go to the Three Sisters, and if you look at the Three Sisters, which is a old um, Aboriginal story about Three Sisters, and um, I'm not sure of the story, but they've got put into stone. And if you look south of that, it's Mount Solitary. And just to the right of Mount Solitary, just before you see it go down, um, that's where I've camped. And I had a stone thrown at my tent at about 2.30 in the morning. Mm. And it's about two and a half hour hike to get there. So no one's going to go there for two and a half hours just to throw one stone at me and walk away. Mm. And I was there with um, another researcher because I said to him that, I previously had an encounter with one of my sons. I got twin boys at the time; they were 11 years old, and one wanted to come along and say, "Yeah, I'll come along with you." And we were camping there, and one of my sons said, "I can hear something walk by, Peterly Dad," because we we're watching all the monster quests and 
all yeah. them kind of shows, and they always talked about bipedal walking, and he's going, Dad, something's walking bipedally down the ridge. I'm like, what? Because I'm getting changed in my sweaty clothes after carrying everything. Yeah. That what you do when you've got a young kid. He, he carries nothing, and he carried the, like, you know, carry the house. <laughs> so we've gone to Nan, he's just cooking marshmallows, and I'm, I'm about to cook some food. And next minute, I'm like, yeah, there is something outside. So I've got changed, I walked out. Something shakes the trees and makes a rah noise and just goes down this 45 degree ridge like bang. And we could hear it for 30 seconds run around through these trees and over falling logs. And I'm going, I don't know what that is, but it's got to be something that I think I'm looking for because there's little bushes there. Well, they scratch the crap out of your legs. Like they, yeah. they draw blood if you walk through there, not run. Yeah. Anyway, so I went there with um, Heath after that and. Um, a fellow researcher, and um, yeah, he said he heard the stone get thrown to my tent and something run through, but he wouldn't get out. He heard me get out, but he goes, I wouldn't get out because I'm too scared. <laughs> and I'm out with my torch. Yeah, we could hear him walking around along the ridge. So that's where we got, that's where um, Attila had a similar thing happen. They had a rock thrown at him and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So we're going to go to that area and do some filming. So we're going to go for a two nights and do some filming there. Yeah. Um, and we're going to do another one or two places. But we've had, we've gone to an area that I've been to before and we had a really, really good night. Yeah. I won't say good, I'll say great. We had a lot of things happen that were really like Yari related and we and, and the boys, Attila and Ben, who um, is in the documentary, said, We've never been to a place like this before. And I told him, this is a place to go. We have to go there to Maramara and and you will, you know, kind of like, you know, if you don't believe in Yowies, once you go there and you know what you're listening for and that, you will believe. And no, we come out of that that night and they, and they were just like, we've got to come back here again. We've got to come back. So um, we probably could quite possibly going to go back there. So I've been there about four times and I've had like recorded howls, vocalizations, wood knocks. I've had something crawl through the creek, which is a bipedal creek. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, um, not a bipedal, sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, um, <laughs> I've got that on my mind. It's yeah. a, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, tidal creek. Mm. And it's walked through a chest height in freezing cold weather in July, which is, the water's just like minus, yeah. and then come through the bush, and other people camping there, got out of their tent, made a big fire, got the torch out, pointing in the same bush as us, and heard this creature run up the uh, up the ridge. So yeah, with that night, there's been a lot of um, we got a lot of um, uh, interesting finds, and yeah. I won't say what happened, but um, it's a really eye-opening night that will be on the um, on the documentary. And, and, and I, I've watched the first 10 minutes of the documentary, mm -hmm. and I said one thing to Attila. I said, Attila, do you look good? And he said, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to make you look good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if you can make me look good, mate, you can make anyone look good. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And, um, no, but he, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. I've watched, like, every documentary you – can see about Yowies or Blue um, or, or um, Bigfoot or anything like the Nat Geos and the mm. Monster Quests and and whatever else is out there, you know, um, yeah, Expedition Unknown and stuff that Josh Gates does. But one thing about what Attila's done, it's he's we are there. He's filming researchers and what researchers do, like myself and Ben, and and there's a couple other researchers that um, he's gone to film as well. And he goes out with them at night and, and asks them questions, what's going on and stuff like that, which we haven't had in Australia. And he and he does it to a degree that you, you just want to see more. Mm. Like, I've seen the first 10 minutes because we did a bit of filming the other night and he showed me the first 10 minutes and I went, look, I know what's in there. I know what is going to be in all the, all the other stuff, but I want to watch it because... 
it just wants me to see more. It's like when you see like a series and you watch the first episode and you, you just can't wait to see the second episode. Yeah. It's just awesome. I just went, Attila, you have done an absolutely fantastic job at making this something that it just draws you in. It's just like, you know, it, 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 I, I can't explain it, how good he's done this. It's, yeah. it's really, really good. And I know he takes the time and the effort and he, you know, he's, he, he's just... The little details, that's yeah. what the main thing is about it. The little details that he wants to get fine. And sometimes we, we might be doing things like walking along a, a hiking trail to get to where we want to do. And he goes, nah, you didn't do that properly. I want you to do it again. I want this little, I want this to be perfect. So, you know, you know, it, it, it's it's something that I'm really happy to be in. Like, I'm really glad I'm going to be in it. And, and, and it's, it's going to be something that I hope that, look, we're hoping to get a second series out of it mm. um, after the first one, and it might get to be something even bigger and go around Australia wide. But at the moment, it's I, I think people are going to be really surprised how good this is going to be. Mm. I, I, look, I watched the first ten minutes and I went, "Oh, this is fantastic! This is awesome!" Like, um, and and like I'm in it, and, I, and I'm looking at it going, "Gee, this is great!" Like, mate, you've done a perfect job. You can't. I, I've never seen better. So. I know, I'm, you know, people might think, oh, you're beefing it up because you're in it. But no, yeah. you, you, you've got to watch it. And he tells you why he's in it, why he's doing it yeah. and all that. And, and, and he's really good at how he videos everything in yeah. certain angles and all that kind of stuff. And, and the questions he asks us while we're out there, what did you see and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it's, you know... He knows what he's talking about, and he knows how to film a documentary. He's done plenty of them. Yep. They're already on like Netflix, Amazon Prime. So he's not an amateur. He knows what he's doing, and, and um, he's been around doing the game for a while. And, and I've known him for a long time, and 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 he's really he he, he just knows his stuff, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we touched on last time we spoke, Dan, I, I, I'm I'm astounded that it's taken this long for someone to actually do a film or a documentary about the Yowie. I, I am absolutely astounded. I mean, maybe it's because I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not bigging myself up. Maybe I know a bit more about the subject than some some people or, or general public, certainly. But it's it's something I've always been, you know, like I said to you earlier, I've been fascinated with these creatures for the, since I first heard of them about 20 years ago. And I, I don't understand why nobody, nobody's really embraced this before before tracks kind of come along because it's 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 a subject for me and I think there's enough sightings that would compel you to think we need to do something here because with the greatest respect you know there are thousands of films about Bigfoot you know even Mothman that there are yeah. hundreds of documentaries about something that happened over 13 months you know we're talking about when we come compare that to the Yowie which is a you know a consistently reported story that goes back before you know western uh, expansion into the country you know these these stories go back gener thousands of years so I, I just don't understand why it's taken so long I mean I'm delighted I can't wait to see it but I, I just I don't understand why it's taken so long for somebody to grab this story by the scruff of the neck Dan well the reason is it's it's money mm. you've got to have enough money to 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 you know do this time and Plus, get the right people that you think that are gonna, you know, have got the right, um, have got a lot of uh, uh, data. Like I've got a lot of sound recordings, mm. a lot of um, a few videos, and and you want to get the right people to, you know, put into that documentary. Um, Attila come and, and asked me, sent me an email. Um, I'm I'm gonna make a documentary. Would you like to be into it? I said, yeah, no worries. I said. I've got it some stuff and I've got it on the internet already. Um, I'm happy to give you anything I've got. And um, but it, 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 but then you got to look at Australia is really really big and there's a lot of people that they want to they talk about the Yowies and stuff, but mm. they might have a lot of information. With, they might have a lot of sound recordings and stuff like that, but they don't want to give it out. Yeah. They they don't want to look stupid in a lot of in, in front of their friends you know look personally I come out and say yeah I'll do this and do that 
And my friends still give me, like, some friends still give me, oh, Yowie Dan, yeah, you, you, you going out and see Yowies? And they still <laughs> give me a bit of bit of jib and give it to me. And I'm like, yeah, come out with me. Let's go out. Come on. I'm going night hiking tonight. Well, I'm going to do 5Ks up in the blue mountain. Oh, no, I'm not going out. Why? It's easy walking. You know, you don't have to be fit. Oh, I'm not going out. Why? What, are you scared of drop bears? You know, like, you know, and they won't come out. But I know in the back of their mind, I might think, oh, this thing's real. So, yeah. um, you know, they, I, I, I still get it, but I just laugh at them and go, yeah, I'm into it. But I'm doing documentaries and and, and I'm having fun. And what I say to a lot of people is that I met a lot of good people, like great people that I never would have known if I didn't do all this stuff. And mm. we have a fun time out and we'll have camp outs and we'll go and search for yowies. And if we don't find them, we'll have a few beers and have a bit of a laugh afterwards and camp out for a few days and yeah. stuff like that. But, you know, but you know what? A lot of times there's been a lot of, like, animals that they thought that was extinct and researchers like yow researchers or people looking for thylacines or whatever have videotaped or taken a photo of a, a, some bird that's supposed to be extinct or a quoll that shouldn't be in that area. Yeah. And then they send it into national parks, and that, that shouldn't be there. That's the first time it's been filmed in 60 years. So we find creatures that shouldn't be there, but they're still living there. Yeah. So that's it, it, it's, there's a lot of, a, lot of like findings coming out other than Yarra research when you go out there. Yeah, yeah. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. One thing I want to talk about is um, uh, just... Everyone, how they do their research. Yeah. Um, in Australia, there's been a lot of um, people, you know, putting up blurry pictures and stuff like that. And what do you think of this? So, um, just to anyone that's listening to this, if you get a picture and it looks a bit abnormal, something might be there. Go back to the same spot. If it's the same time of day, take a photo and actually walk into the area, and then take another picture. Because I've taken a few pictures where something looks weird but then i've gone in and then looks like heads and shoulders and that kind of thing and it's only like a old tree stump that's you know been rotted away kind of thing so instead of just posting one picture and say what do you think this is and putting a red circle around it go in and take a bit of time to do a little bit of a little bit of follow-up research you know it, it doesn't take much if you've gone into that area once it's you know you can go back into the area again and take a photo Maybe the next day or day later. If you take a photo the next day and it looks completely different, same time of day, same amount of the cloud or sun, and you want, hey, there was something there. That's what we want, you know. Instead of taking that one picture and it looks like a dark shadow, there and say, oh, look at this, mm. like, well, pareidolia. That's yep. what. That's the big thing. That's 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 a thing that's really running rampant all over the world at the moment. You know, people take one picture and think, yeah, that must be a yowie or bigfoot. Like, you know, come on, just a little bit of time, take a photo. But why take a photo and then walk away? Go to the area while you're there and have a look. If you're a little bit unsure, if you're with another person, maybe walk away and come back there later and take another photo, maybe 20 minutes later. And if it looks the same, you think, oh, well, if that's going to be a creature, we might as well walk in and have a look because what's a creature going to be doing standing in the same position for 20 minutes? Yeah. So, yeah, a little bit of follow-up research. That, that, that's all we ask. And it's, you know, I think some people are doing things wrong and that kind of is like going through to other people. They, they're watching what some people do, which is a wrong thing to do, and they're taking it on board as the right thing to do when it's not. Yeah. So the best thing to do is, you know, just if you're taking a photo, you know, instead of putting up what do you think this is, you know, take a follow-up photo first and then say, all right, what do you think this is? All right, but then I've come back and I've done this mm. and I've gone to the area. There's nothing there. And then you can go, all right, something was there. So it's just it's just common sense, just a little bit of common sense, a little bit of time taken to do the research properly. And and that's all, that's all we ask because I've gone to a few areas myself and I thought there was like some things happening there and, heard things walking around and stuff. And then when I've gone back there, I've noticed it was only like wombats walking around, stuff like that. Yeah. So, but I've got a few sound recordings, which I'm sitting there going, well, look, what's going to be jumping off a cliff here down to the, oh, 
creek bed onto the creek, walking through freezing cold water at minus three degrees at four o'clock in the morning in the Blue Mountains. And well, I don't know who's going to walk through water at minus three degrees in the morning. So yeah. there's some things that I've actually had, like even the Cox's River, when I did the uh, K to K, which is Canangra to Katoomba, which is like about a 50, 55K hike. Yeah. And I put a sound, that was the only time I put a sound recorder out the whole time because it was that hard. I, for me, I put it up there with the Kakoda Trail because it was that hard. We we're just dead every day. Yeah. As soon as we got to the campsite, we'd make a campsite, put a tent up, make something to eat, eat it straight to bed because yeah. you had nothing left. You were yeah. hiking like, it wasn't, nothing was flat. And, um, when I put my sound recorder out, after maybe two or three hours, something walked up to the sound recorder. I walked around it. You can hear it on two legs and then walk away. And I was like, there's no kangaroos. There's no possums or nothing or wallabies here. And they hop. You can hear it hop. And it was on sand. So it was something that was really heavy that had to make it make mm. that noise. And um, we heard a few wood knocks when we first got in there when we well, like put our tents up and we started collecting water and then uh, we had um, some uh, filtration systems to filter the water because they said some of the water is contaminated it comes down the Cox's River due to um, affluent in there. So you had to be really careful. Yeah. So, uh, yes, but there's a lot of places in the Blue Mountains that there's, there's... It's like anywhere, even in, in America, there's a lot of places that it's got the concentrations of sightings and and activity and other places is only sparsely happening so it's the places that only happen sparsely that i'm i'm interested in because the people that live there you go to them, oh there's a yeah he's here and they said well we've had a few things happen you know kind of that kind of thing and they're kind of like you know not sure they're a bit iffy 50 50 percent and they're the ones that i'm interested in because they're not saying yeah there must be a definite thing here they're the ones that are saying that yeah, there's something weird happening, and they live near the bush, and they know all the noises from the creatures that live near the bush. And when they hear something weird, and they tell you about it, then they open up. They're the ones that I, 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 I you know, that I take interest in. I mean, it is. I mean, the other thing that is always kind of. I mean, the size of Australia and the and the terrain, Dan. I think essentially rules out hoaxing because, you know, with the greatest respect. The Australian bush is not the kind of place somebody who's an inexperienced person should be running about pretending to be something, really. Because, you know, there is all kinds of dangers, you know, even from the terrain, the temperature, the, the creatures that could be underfoot. And like you say, you've got to go miles sometimes from anywhere. Nobody in their right mind is going to drive for five hours to hide in a bush on the off chance that somebody walks past. <laughs> Are they? Yeah, it's, yeah, no, exactly right there. But um, yeah, it's the the, the terrain uh, it changes vastly from place to place, but um, and it's all hospitable. You, it, it doesn't matter if it's mountainous or dry arid region or desert. Like it's over really hot or really cold, or you've got plenty of snakes. You've got your ticks, leeches. You've got everything you can imagine and some things you can't imagine will come and bite you or do something to you. And you don't know. You might be allergic to them. Mm. And we'll put it this way. The last time we did filming for track, we all walked out with a tick. Yeah. We all yeah. had ticks on us. Yeah, we all had a tick. And these ticks, if you don't get the head out of them, they get into your system, they're going to kill you. Yeah. So we all had ticks. I wake up and I'm like, oh, what's that sort of? My missus, oh, what's that? I said, oh, it's a tick. It's the first ever tick I've ever had. But I've got a tick because we did walk through, like, it was all um, uh, ferns and they were probably, they were pretty high. They were about, like, five, five and a half foot high. So we're walking yeah. through ferns. And actually, we, we, we tried to, um, we inflated the SS Yowie, which is a little inflatable <laughs> boat, of course. So I nicknamed it the SS Yowie. Yeah. But unfortunately, where we wanted to go across the tidal creek, uh, it was low tide and it was all muddy. So I walked in there and I was up to my knees in mud. Oh. Anyway, by the time I got in the middle of the creek, I was on top, I was out of it. And I'm like, come on, boys, we can go over. And they go, no, we don't think so. I'm like, all right, we'll stay across the other So I had to come out and I had to, you know, take all the uh, all the mud off my legs and everything. 
and we still got a lot of things that night. That was the Marimau, one of the Marimau nights. But um, yeah, we yeah, I got the inflatable boat and called the SS Yowie. So the boys had a bit of a laugh about that, and I said a few <laughs> fellow researchers, SS Yowie, and they uh, put the text out SS Yowie. So I said the SS Yowie hasn't been uh, officially, you know, brought out yet. I might have to get like a bottle of bourbon and crack it on the side and say, no, oh, I better not waste bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get something you don't want to drink, Dan. Don't yeah, waste Foster's. Good... <laughs> yeah, don't waste good bourbon no one... on that, mate. No, no one drinks Foster's in. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so when, when's the film going to be due out, Dan? Um, look, uh, that's up to how long it takes a teller to make it up. Like, I've only seen 10 minutes of it, and we've been doing it for about three months. So uh, it, it's a time-consuming thing for a teller. He does it all by himself, and he's really good at it. Mm. Um, so I've been told end of this year or the start of next year. So you're probably really looking at the start of next year, like mm. February, March or April or something like that. But it, 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 might, it depends on who picks it up. It could be like Netflix, it could be Amazon Prime, it could be something like that. It's going to be one of them platforms. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. It's up to Wattello. He's the one that's, you know, it's, it's his little baby and I'm just involved in it. And um, But when it comes out, you know, we'll let you – everyone know and have a bit of a talk about it but um no it, it's it's a really it's really interesting going to places and and being there with fellow researchers that are on the same level as you and you, you know you pick up certain things that people that don't research the always like they won't you know necessarily pick up oh what was that you hear that noise over there or did you hear that little vocalization you pick up things after you've been doing it for a while that gives you, like, uh, you know, like you, you can say, hey, there's something there. Just concentrate on this area of the parabolic dish because something might happen. And more than likely, after a couple of minutes, you bang, would not, right where you, you know, got your parabolic dish. So that's, that's, it's all about anything. You research stuff long enough, you know, you might research lions and tigers or kangaroos or whatever it is. Yeah. You know their, ha- their habits and what they're liable to do. And, you know, you just sit there and just, you know, you might wait 10 minutes, but they'll give you what you want. You know, you record something interesting. And But like like I said before, like we both said, the Australian bush is so big. People think it's like plains and it's open and there's kangaroos hopping around like the like in Africa. It's very different to what people think. And yeah. it's very harsh and it's very dangerous. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, I think, Dan. Have you noticed... I mean, because obviously you've been doing this for, what, nearly 15 years yourself? Yeah. So have you noticed over the last, I don't know, three to five years, more people are, are coming out looking for <coughs> the hours? As, it, as, the, as the information and the internet spreads it around, have you noticed a, a, an influx of, of people just, you know, going for a wander around the bush badly prepared? Well, that's like I said before, it's a flavour of the month. It's just people coming out from everywhere because of the platforms available now and people, the amount of people telling what they saw. And there's people coming out the saying, oh, I saw this in 1950 or 1960 and I was out with three mates, but I don't want to say nothing because, you know, they make me feel like I'm an idiot. But, yeah, there's a lot of people coming out and, and, and they're telling their stories and, 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 and look, they're all the same, and but the stories are really, they're all really different. And what, when I write in the Yowie Times, the most loved article is the witness reports, was what people want is the individual reality of what people tell. Mm. You know, they say, I saw one while I'm fishing, and I saw one while driving a car and it ran across in front of me, and this is what it did. And people just want what it did in different occasions, and that's why... A lot of the audio reports from the AYR are so fascinating because they're all different. Yeah. People are doing different things. They're swimming in a creek and they're driving a car, which is like, you know, you've got to remember if you're going to drive from like the top of um, New South Wales to the bottom, it's going to take you like you know, a day and a half or something to do that. It's, yeah. Australia's really big. So there's a lot of bush involved. Once you get out of the, like from Sydney, South or north of Sydney, there's, it's just constant trees. That's all you see. Yeah. And then, like, I drove from um, uh, Canberra 
and I had to drive to the to the um, really towards the the coast mm. to see um, the guy Rusty who does the Rusty Triple Two channel, and he said to me, "Watch out when you get to Braidwood because there's the roo- there's a lot of roos there." And I drove along in my car, and we were doing it about ten o'clock at night. And there was a kangaroo right in the middle of the road on the double lines, and it was about seven foot tall. But I wasn't worried about that one because he was facing to my right because I know he was going to hop that way. I was worried about the one on the white line on the corner of the road. If he did one hop, he was going to hit my car at 100 k's an hour. My car was wiped out. They, they, they virtually ruin your car. If they hop out, they're like hitting a brick wall. Yeah. And then most times they hop away, and your car is just like virtually written off but yeah it's a the, the Australian bush is very harsh and there's a lot of stories coming out there which is really good that's what we want we want fresh stories mm-hmm. and and, and I've, I've got a few people that I, um that I've recently got in contact with and I'm going to go out to a new um fresh encounter which is around the Springwood area in the Blue Mountains one mm-hmm. of the um latest um Subscriber said he's um, he knows a, a lady in the sun that had an encounter there, and I've gone to the Springwood area and camped about ten times, yeah. and every time we've gone there, there's always been uh, some sort of activity happening, mm. and um, and I want to know exactly where they saw this thing, and I'm going to ring them up and have a bit of a talk and try and get them to show me whereabouts, you know, they saw this creature and what happened and. And, and then put it in the Yowie Times. And what I'm doing with the Yowie Times, I was going to do it every month and then doing it every, every three months after yep. this August issue. The main reason why I'm doing that is because I'm trying to give everyone time to get a good, like a good article. Yep. Like every, every month, there's not, it's not every month, like I've learned after two years now, there's not always stuff that comes out. There's not always, uh, a sighting, or someone doesn't get any anything to write about. Not everyone can get a chance to research, like myself. Mm. And what I want to do is, I want to go back to sitting my sound recorder and my trail cams out. And what I get, I can write in the Yowie Times. And everyone else, after three months, they will have something, and they might write a ten-page article. So it might go from being instead of forty pages, one one month, it might get to be like 80 or 90 for every three months. So you get a massive big um, uh, uh, issue and it might take you like two months to read it if you, if you kind of spread it out. Mm. And I, I, I want to I keep the early times and I want to have it, you know, I want to keep the articles good. I don't want to have them compromised with people writing articles just because it's the next month and well, let's get an article out. And, and, and people read and go, oh, that's not really that good. But, you know, you, 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 sometimes with researching with the Yowies, it's sometimes things get a bit quiet and nothing much happens. And then all of a sudden, yes, everything happens. Like it's that time of the month and they're all like, I even discussed in one of the, uh, this is the latest article in the Yowie Times about the breeding patterns yeah. of the Yowie. No one's gone into that. So basically what I said was, I went. I looked at three different apes, which is the um, chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Yeah. And I looked at their breeding cycles and how many uh, siblings they have, and how many times do they breed between each each young and stuff like that, and tried to put it into context to say maybe this might be a Yowie's breeding cycle. Yeah. They breed this many times. <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. I won't go too much into it. You've got to read the Yowie Times to get into it. But I'm trying to put that into it because not many people talk about that kind of stuff. Because how many Yowies are in Australia? Is there hundreds or is there thousands? Because there's scientists that said that there's got to be a certain many of individuals to make it um, like that they can keep going. They, You know, like if there's only a couple of hundred, it might be enough for them to keep going and they die out and... 10 years. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I think, the, yeah, it's, I th- I think is, it, is it around the, the population has to be at least 500 for the gene pool? It's something like that. It's it got is, to be, isn't I've it? heard of, yeah. So, look, if you, but if you look at Australia, you've got New South Wales is huge, Queensland's even bigger, Victoria's a bit smaller, yeah. but then you've got Northern Territory and, and Western Australia, 
and Tasmania, which is really nothing there. It's just the thylacine and South Australia. <laughs> it's mainly it's mainly down the eastern side, which is Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. Yeah. And like in Queensland and New South Wales, and some parts of Victoria, there's no one's ever been there. And like mm. Australia's two hundred over two hundred years old, and no one's ever been there. You just like you could hike in there and you just get lost. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, so the, like you said, the gene pool's got to be so many, you know, different genes for them to keep going. So I'm trying to just put the question out there to people to get them thinking, like, how old is the Yowie in, in one article, and then how many is out there? Mm-hmm. Like, how long? How do they? Br- like, look at look at humans. We can breed every nine months, yeah. but do Yowies? only breed when it's like a good season. Like we're in El Nino now yeah. and in the, the the Sydney water, which is just, it runs all down from the Blue Mountains and goes to Lake Burragarang. Mm. And you can see that from um, the end of King Table Ends Road. It's called McMahon's Lookout. And the, it, it's really low. Yeah. Like they're already saying now that we might have water restrictions where you can't even hose your car or hose your gutter, stuff like that. And you can only hose you, you can only do this at after 10, 10 o'clock in the morning and after four o'clock in the afternoon and stuff like that. Yeah. And we and I think it was over a decade ago we had water restrictions and there was people in cars driving around. If you were doing the wrong thing, they come and fine you two hundred and fifty dollars mm. for using the water wrong. Yeah, so that's how it's getting. And um, yeah, so um, and then all of a sudden when the El Nino goes, it comes to La Nina, the water just comes down like it's you know. It floods the place. Yeah, well, and, you've got, it, and, seems, it seems at the minute, Dan, you've got the complete two extremes down there because obviously I'm, I'm one of those people. I, I like to keep my eye on, you know, situations. And so I'm obviously, you know, I don't live in Australia, but I'm fully aware of, of, of this kind of drought, flood, drought, flood cycle. You, It's basically all or nothing with you guys over the last sort of 10 years, isn't it? Yeah, but it's really weird because we can have like Queensland – raining like it's a monsoon mm. and New South Wales in a drought but all the rain comes through down Queensland and goes through down the western part of New South Wales and it floods all them country towns in New South Wales because it all flood it all comes from Queensland goes all through New South Wales and goes down to um South Australia which is called Lake Eyre mm. and Lake Eyre there's nothing there but once every 10 or 20 years it'll fill up yeah full of water and, it'll be, and then all of a sudden, there's pelicans and all these birds turn up. And it's really weird. And it's yeah. only once every 10 or 20 years. And it's a massive area which would probably like cover half a state in, 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 in America. Yeah. So it's really weird how one, one state in Australia can be in drought, but the other one's pouring down rain. But then after maybe a week, all that water comes and floods all the country towns where it floods them, where it's like, like as deep as a house. Yeah. And it comes in like a click of your fingers. And when oh. the authorities tell you to get out, you got to get out because, yeah, they get flooded. They just, they just washes everything away. Yeah, yeah. I've and seen, that's what uh, happens. I've seen a couple of documentaries over the um, over the last couple of years in regards to some of that. And um, I remember interviewing one guy somewhere. I think he was trapped on a roof for about four days. Yeah, and, that happens here, and, yeah. Like and he, way, and yeah. he was just saying, he was sat on a roof just watching bodies float by for, for four days. He said it was yeah. unbelievable. And, and I think they, it had, I think it was just normally where they lived, it was just a little creek. Nice, no no real problems there. The kids used to play in it. It was it was fine, you know what I mean? And then they had a flash flood. And they, it, I think 10 foot of water they got. And it was just, oh. as far as the eye and could it, see, was just water. Yeah, and, and and if you get swept into it, you, sure. you you're gone, and you don't get found again. You're under tons of mud, and if it's not that, you get the fire. Yeah. And the last big fire we had was in like Victoria. We call it um, we had a big bad one, but when I was growing up in the 80s, called Ash Wednesday, and it just burned everything. But this one was called Black Monday, yeah. and it was in Victoria, and they virtually the the authorities didn't really give anyone like. They gave them notice, but not soon enough. Yeah. And a lot of people died, and it come and burnt a lot of towns and a lot of small towns in Victoria, and it come in that quick. And um, so it's all about you got a flood or you got a fire. And then there are things that, you know, people say, well, what about 
you know, animals like yowies, how are they going to survive? I'm going, well, what about kangaroos? What about wallabies? What about wombats? What if they all survive? Yeah. Like, it doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, you know, you, you've got high ground and low ground. And, you know, like, you look at the yowies, when they've seen, they're always near some sort of mountainous region. Yeah. The Blue Mountains, you've got Springbrook. Springbrook, and Ades, if you go to, like, Queensland, you've got the Gold Coast. Which is and, and, and it's like Sunshine Coast. It's all like a area for it's all beaches. The beach it goes as far as you can see. You can go swimming there, yeah. like clubs and stuff. But if you go 20, 30 k's in the bush, it's all mountains. Mm. And it's Springbrook National Park and there's other. I, I don't live up there, but there's a lot of different national parks like here. So you, you go within a half an hour from the coast, it's all mountains. Yeah. So that's where they live. So. You know, they don't always live on the plane. They'll, most of the time you see them, they're going from one side to the other, and then people say, yep, yeah, they went running straight up the side of the bush or the ridge, and they went straight up, and they're going, gee, they've done like 50 metres up 45-degree angle and about four strides. Yeah. I mean, and that's th- what gets people. Yeah. I mean, the other thing as well, Danny, is animals are usually quite intuitive when it comes to things like this. They can tend to sense flood before it occurs. You know, I mean, you know there are numerous stories yep. of animals across the world where you know certain disasters have occurred or, or and, and if anything it's usually domestic animals that suffer the most because obviously they seem to have you know they're usually in situations that they can't escape but there are hundreds and thousands of occasions where you know animals across the world have managed to get out of areas be it through volcanoes or earthquakes or floods because they seem to sense something's coming so why wouldn't they yeah yeah, exactly. And, 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 like, you look at the animals, like, they're a lot older than us. Yeah. So you look at, you know, the megafaunas, which has come down to the kangaroos and wombats and all that wallabies and the yowies and even birds. Birds have come from, you know, they said they're, they're, they're dinosaurs. Mm. That, so they've been around for millions and millions of years. So they've, you know, gone down to learn that, learn to what vibrations and different kind of probably the way the earth cools or something. I don't know. I don't yeah. know how to, no one knows how they do it. You know, they, they just got that knack to know that something bad's going to happen. Let's get the F out of the area. <laughs> and the humans are like, what's going on? Is this thing a beer you now? What's going on? And the next minute, like, oh shit, hit the fan. I'm like, yeah. we're all too late. Like, why don't we have it? Are we not been around long enough to know what, you know, yeah. that get that feeling? I think it's just one of those things. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's one of those uh, sensations. I mean, for me, the, I think the, the the closest thing I can compare it to is that if there's a thunderstorm coming, you can tell you, it, it, the air changes. Yeah. It smells different. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Dan? And you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. But plus, you, you, you get the cold front. It goes from being warm. Usually when it's like here in Australia, I don't know about you, where you live in, in England, but usually it's like it gets really warm. Like there was, we haven't had much rain in in, in um, this um, winter time. Mm. It's been really warm. We've, we've been having 27 degrees in winter, 23 yeah. degrees, and it's like in July and it's August now. It's usually a windy month. But the other week we had a bit of a rain there for about a day or two, and it was like I think Friday week back, and I was sitting there going, "Gee, it's warm," yeah. and then all of a sudden they just got really cold, and I went. Yeah, the rain's coming. And next minute, cloud come over, it rained. And after about an hour, it was all gone. Yeah. It was like one big massive cloud. So we can sense things like that. But they're like, any Tom, Dick or Harry can know, gee, it's gone from hot to cold. Yeah. <laughs> big dark clouds coming over, it's going to rain, you know. But when it's like, you know, uh, you know, hours before like a tsunami's coming or uh, an earthquake, stuff like that, the birds, you know, they just all the animals just disappear. They're gone. Yeah. And so, what have they got that we we don't know? Like, they got they must have some sense in their ears or something that yeah. really gets them like nervy, and they know something bad's going to happen. Let's get out of the area Absolutely. where 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 we don't. So, you know, people say that about the yowies. Like, what do they eat and what do they do? I'm like, we don't know. Like, a lot of people say, all right, what's a yowie? And we say, all right, hominoid creature, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, well, what do they eat? And we're saying, well, this is all the stuff that's out there. If you're like a big ape creature, like chimp- chimpanzees sometimes go and eat meat, they'll chase down another uh, ape and they'll 
eat it. Yep. I said, they can eat meat. They've got plenty of animals to eat. There's plenty of, you know, different rats and rodents and you've got wallabies and, and, and possums and whatever else out, out there, plus wild dogs and cats and everything. I said, there's heaps of food out there in the bush. They, they, they search for it. And, and a lot of people say that they didn't see this creature, but when it suddenly moved and it was standing in the tree line, that's when they noticed it. Mm. And it was it, now what what happens is a lot of people think that the yowies are right in the bush, and they'll look past the tree line into the bush, but actually the creature is standing right in the tree line. That's what they do. They stand on the tree line and act themselves like they're a tree, mm. and they don't want to look at you. They want to spy on you for whatever reason. I don't know. But people look past that and they look in the, into the trees and they go, I can't see nothing. And then all, all of a sudden they come back and go, Oh wait, wait, there's something there. And once it moves, and that's when they start picking it up. They, they're really crafty creatures, mate. They, 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 they you know, they, they put themselves out there sometimes, but they're really hard to see because they live in this habitat and they're a creature that's real, well adapted. They've been there for a long, long time and they just know how to blend into the, in, into the surrounding bush. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting. I was talking to um, Robert Robinson, uh, yeah. who, who wrote a book called Legend Tripping. Um, yeah. And he's ex ex forces, but he was on about talking to special forces guy because he's a he's a big uh, believer in the Bigfoot um, situation. As as with Yowies and Almastis and Yerrans, he thinks you know obviously there are there are creatures out there that we're we're yet to scientifically prove. But he was talking about um, special forces training Dan, and um, one of the things they're taught is if if at any point you're out in the field and you see the enemy you stop moving and you look down at the ground and you essentially become invisible because mm. it's your eyes yeah. that give you away. Yeah. It is. I've been told by um, a few, one or two people that um, is uh, that know people that are been in the SAS or in the army. Mm. Uh, in uh, New South Wales, they drop them in the Jamison Valley, which is right where in between... Uh, the Three Sisters in Mount Solitary. Mm. And there's a, there is a um, AYR report about someone that was in the SAS with two or three guys and they followed them. It's on the YouTube. Mm. But there's one, there's one uh, I've been told about somewhere up in Queensland. There's actually um, someone that I know asked one of the um, guys that, that was up there and he said, I think it was a sergeant or something, said, um, if you go into this area, don't go by yourself because you won't come back. And he said, why? He goes, don't, I'm not going to tell you why, but you won't come back. So what's that saying? <laughs> like, there's no animal. That's what, he, that's, what that, that's what was told to him. He said, you won't come back. You have to go with at least another person. And he's like, why, why? And it was like, say, so, you know, like, what's going to get me? And he wouldn't tell him. And then he kind of finally thought, shoot, this Yowie thing might be true. And that's what yeah. he was told. Don't go it's in there. Because the basically the guy said, we don't know what's out there, but you won't come back. Yeah. I, I think the one thing that's I've what... learned over the last 30 years of being into this kind of subject, Dan, is I am never going in the woods on my own, ever. <laughs> I have. I don't care. Well, I have. rather you than me, sir. <laughs> I have. But uh, um, after doing it for a, a, a few times, probably about... 10 or 12 um i've got a little bit older a bit wiser and mainly mainly just for safety <laughs> i won't go out there but the safety was i might break my ankle yeah. i might get bitten by a snake i never thought about getting attacked by a yowie <laughs> that that never came into my mind it's probably a bit stupid i didn't think about that but um that was the only reason why i thought not to do that yeah 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 and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah but um and then Attila and i'd say you're crazy man you, you're going at it by yourself. I said, yeah, but I've got some of my best material. I might have to do it again, but I don't want to get bit by a snake or break my ankle because I'm not as fit as I used to be. And if I hurt myself, how am I going to get out? Yeah, that's true. And then they go, but yeah, so that's why, you know, it's I, I got a couple of phone calls, not really messages, like some some of the guys are named for a while. Do oh, you want to go out Saturday night? And I'm like, oh, I can't. I've got things on. And, you know, they... I get a lot of people asking me just to go out and try and help them with picking things out, like 
if you go to a trail that's well used, you see broken branches. Like it's more than likely some kids just going, oh, I'm gonna get the flies off my face, I'll break a branch to yeah. swat them and stuff like that. But once you get into the bush, away from that, and you see some weird things, that's when you take notice of it. So that's what they want to know. But yeah, yeah but it's it, 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 it's the the Australian bush is very interesting, and there's a lot of you know weird things that happen out there. There's a lot of weird noises, and there's even Look, I've, I've made uh, a video of the weird noises that Australian animals make. And even, like, the platypus makes a growl. Yeah. And that's like this little duck thing. I don't even know. Look, look. if you look at a platypus, you've never seen it before. It's got a duck bill. It's this weird-looking thing, and it, it growls too. And I never thought it could growl, but there's a duck, there's a platypus that growls. And if I heard that growl, I didn't think of oh, yeah. For me, before I heard that, I wouldn't think that was a platypus. No. And then... Look and look, the koalas when it's breeding season and that they make like they scream like little girls getting killed in the bush. Yeah. Like I'm telling people like just go, what the hell's that? That's only koalas. Yeah. And they're like, what? Okay, yeah, it's koala. Yeah. But they scream. So the animals. There's even a, a bird. It's, it sounds like a cat. It screams like a cat or something. Yeah. It's called a cat bird or something. Yeah. There's some weird animals in Australia. Birds. Whatever, oh. that makes some really weird calls. Yeah. And if you look them up, I think it's called a cat bird or something. It's in Queensland, not New South Wales, but mm. it's got a really weird sound. So, like, look at Tasmanian Devil. Yeah. It, this thing makes, like, I've never heard it scream other than going to, like, a local, um, uh, uh, you know, like Taronga Zoo or something like that. Yeah. But it mentioned being, like, a first fleeter or something or one of the first inhabitants in um, Tasmania and hearing that screaming in the bush, like, you wouldn't think some little little creature that looks like a little, you know, a little dog <laughs> was screaming like the devil. Right? Oh. So, you know, you, you, you got to get, you got to like kind of take a bit of research to learn what animals are in there, what yeah. birds, creatures, and what kind of noises they make. And then when you hear them, you can kind of pick out what they are because a lot of people go out there, hear a weird noise, saying it's a yowie. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not. You've got to take a bit of time to learn what could be out there and what's in your region. So that's why I made a video up of all these different animals. And it goes from dingoes to platypus to deer, because we've got deer in Australia. They've been introduced to um, foxes. Some of the foxes, they even sound like little girls screaming. And yeah, they're fox, just like yeah, fighting. Fo- foxes screaming is, is, if you've never heard it, it's terrifying the first time you hear it. Oh. It is. So it's all different animals. Even like we've got introduced species and plus our native ones and there's birds and there's owls that make whoop whoops. Yeah. So there's owls that make a whoop like a gorilla makes a whoop. Yeah. And people are like, ah, oh, it's a yowie. I'm like, no, oh, it's just a bird. It's a bird. <laughs> like, so yeah, you, you, you've got to take a bit of research and take a bit of time to research all these things before you go out and say, yeah, this is what it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's what I do. I, I get there and hear a weird thing, and then I'll get there and I'll look up, oh, uh, what, what's a weird owl noise that makes this? And sometimes I'll, yeah, that's what it is, and that's how I've worked out what things are. So a lot of times I'm out there and I take people out for the first time, and they're like, oh, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's just an owl. And, what? and they're all freaking out. It's just an owl, mate. It's just a bird. Don't worry about it. And they think it's some sort of weird creature that's going to kill them. <laughs> and I'm just, sitting, I'm just sitting back in my chair, got me bourbon in my hand. It's just an hour, mate. Don't worry, it's all good. It's all good. Don't worry, it's nothing. But when, <laughs> but when things start walking around bipedally and out in the bush, that's when I say, hey, yeah, we've got something here. Yeah. So, but yeah. yeah, you still got to take your time and research your areas. And a lot of areas that have got a lot of history, they still produce results. Hmm. It's not like they've been there a hundred years ago and they're gone. They're still there. It might not be in the same amount they were 100 years ago, but they're still there. You yeah. know, like we've got a bay here in um, in New South Wales called Yowie Bay, and then you go to the Canberra, and it's like Devil's Canyon, Devil's Devil's Peak, yeah. Devil's like Devil's Creek. Why is it called Devil? Like why? There must have been mm. something going on there. So, <laughs> but there's a few. There's a fellow researcher, Dave Reed, that lives in Canberra, and he's. He's trying to find out why they called them all devils, but he goes, I know one that's called devils because the sound that comes out of the area, it sounds like there's a devil there. And there's no 
there's no such thing as a, a Tasmanian devil on the mainland. They're all dead, so they're only on Tasmania. So he goes, I don't know what's screaming there, but it's certainly not a Tassie devil. So um, I want to go down there when it gets a bit warmer because Canberra mm. gets into the minus. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not, it's not, Canberra in the summer, it's like in the middle of like New South Wales. It's the capital territory of Australia yeah. where all the politicians are and they, you know, make all the stupid rules. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it gets really cold in the winter and it gets really hot in the summer. So, but there's been a lot of, Research has come out of that, that area. They've had a, some good results. So I want to go down there a few times, but I just haven't had the, the time at the moment. But, yeah, Dave goes he, – he he's knows a lot about tree scars from the Aboriginal tree scars and where they've made shields or something from the, the, the bark and all that kind of stuff. So he's right into that. So he knows a lot about the area, and he's got a YouTube channel, um, Dave Rowan Reed, and he talks about all everything about the uh, – the um, uh, uh, Canberra area. Mm. So if anyone wants to look at that, just look up Dave Rowan Reed, and he, he talks about a little bit about the. Uh, he, he goes out and discusses. He might only five ten minute videos, but they're, they're really informative. And um, if anyone wants to ask him any questions about Canberra, and he, he, he he's got some great knowledge of the area because he's um, grown up there all his life. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. Right. So Dan. Where can everybody catch up with you? How do they get hold of the Yowie Times? And what's next for you going forwards, my friend? Well, if you want to subscribe, <coughs> sorry, subscribe to the Yowie Times, it's Australian Yowie, lowercase, so Australian Yowie at gmail.com. Um, and basically, um, uh, I'm, we're still in the progress of making the, um, uh, the track documentary, which will come out more than likely early next year. Um, but when it comes out, everyone will know about it. And, um, yeah, we're basically just getting out there and looking for signs of the Australian Yowie and trying to get the best evidence we can because there's still a lot of people out there that, that think it's just a fictitious creature. It's just something from the dream time. But there's more and more people coming out there telling stories that we've seen it might be 30, 40 years ago or within the last few months or the last few weeks. So, um, yeah, it, it, not that many people can be bullshitting about what they've seen. There's, there's got to be some truth to these stories. Yeah, very much. Well, like I said earlier on, Dan, th there seems to be a real momentum at the minute. So um, I just look forward to, to keeping up to date with everything and, uh, and seeing how you're getting on and reading my Yowie Times when it turns up in my inbox, as always. So... Um, Thank you for your time as always, mate, today, and uh, keep on doing what you're doing and look forward to speaking to you again sometime. All right, thanks, Paul. But the Yowie Times uh, will get released in about five days' time, and after this one, it, it won't be out until every three months after this. So it just gives us more time to get information to make it a good read and keep the, keep the, um, the, the you know, what are the standard up? So, yeah. but um, yeah, anything that comes up about you know, if, a, if someone's driving a truck and a yowie wants to jump on it and you know, you know, do a planking or whatever they want to do, <laughs> <laughs> I won't get into anything else. And he wants to do something, and uh, I'll, I'll say, Paul, come on, we've got some stories. Just uh, just get out there. But yeah, um, yeah, look, I've gone out there plenty of times by myself and I have been freaked out where I do not want to get out of the tent but there's a lot of times where look nothing happens and you're just not in the right area at the right time but it's like anything but mm. anyway we, we, we'll keep pursuing this creature and, and, and like everyone that's on all the YouTube channels and all the uh, Facebook channels um, we're all trying to find out what this creature is no one knows what it is because that's what we get asked what is this creature no one knows but we can only give our theories and what what it is, and hopefully in the end we'll find out what it is, and then and and you know and answer some questions. Brilliant. Well, listen, thanks again as always, Dan. It's always fascinating to have a good chat with you about the Yowie. Um, you keep on doing what you're doing. You stay safe out there, and we'll speak soon. All right, my friend. We'll do. Thanks, Paul. I'll catch you later. You're very welcome. Take care, Dan. Okay. Bye. <laughs>